Hey everybody, thank you guys for joining us again today. Uh, man, we're so excited just to kind of be in the new year and be in this new series called Reset. And if you were with us last week, we jumped right into Genesis chapter one and chapter two as we looked at God as the creator of all things. And I just thought that was a really appropriate uh, way to begin the year. Obviously, as we just look at the beginning of the world, the beginning of the universe, not the beginning of God, but the beginning of all that he was doing in human history, in creation, and kind of setting into motion the course of events that would lead us to where we are today in uh, kind of on this side of the gospel and this side of Jesus and, and all that we know to be true that the scriptures have taught us. Um, so, so we started in the beginning. So like I said, if you were with us last week, you heard about the creation, how God kind of laid out this perfect creation just the way that he wanted it. And we we read in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 over and over and over again, as God is creating things, he keeps saying, it was good, it was good, it was good. And at the very end, after he creates man and woman, he even says that it was very good. And Genesis chapter 2 actually ends with this phrase. It says that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no Shame. What a, what a beautiful existence, right? That just Adam and Eve living in this perfect paradise that God had created for them, able to just enjoy all the fruits that he has given them and all the, all the creation, all the animals, all the nature, everything, and even enjoy one another in relationship with each other and in perfect relationship to God. And so that they're, they're naked and they feel no shame. This kind of sets us up for what's coming in chapter three. And if you've been uh, around church, been a Christian for a little while, you know what's coming in chapter three. But if you don't, um, I kind of want to pause for just a second and really just um, kind of kind of speak into what we're about to read. And here's, here's what I want us to be thinking about today. That as human beings, we in our nature, we love to hide. We love to hide. Um, and, and that might sound like, uh, you know, your, your mind might instantly kind of go to hide and seek as a kid, right? You love that game. I love that game. Even uh, still today, I'm the I'm the youth pastor here. And, you know, sometimes we'll play hide and go seek uh, like at a lock in or something like that. And kids just they love that. We love to we love to hide. We love to have people find us. We love to sit and just wait and anticipate whether or not we we found the perfect hiding spot. And it's it's just always a big hit. And as a kid, that's probably one of your very favorite games. I know it was mine, especially like hide and go seek in the dark. Um, just love to, to find those perfect spots. But here's the reality, though, for us as human beings, that hiding isn't always about fun. In fact, a lot of times our hiding in our nature, it's because we're afraid. Or we maybe hide because we get accused of something. Or maybe we hide because we feel ashamed. And we know that hiding is in our nature because from the very beginning, what we're about to read here in Genesis 3 we see that our, our oldest ancestors, Adam and Eve, as soon as this relationship that they had with God is broken through sin, they do this very thing. They go and they hide. So let's read this story. Um, starting in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. Now, remember, this is right after Genesis 1 and 2, where all things are perfect, and the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, are naked and feel no shame. Now, it says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now I want to pause here before we move on with the story. So just to kind of recap, we have the serpent, 
right? And, and later in Scripture, both the apostles Paul and John kind of clarify for us just to make sure we're really clear. This is the devil himself, whether it was kind of like a, a, the, a Satan f- when he fell. Now, he fell from, from Scripture. We know this, that he fell from heaven sometime between um, the beginning of creation, that God actually created the angels, and that would include Satan along with them, um, and sometime between the perfect creation that God made and this story in Genesis 3, Satan fell and he came to the earth and he began to kind of set himself up as the um, opponent of mankind. In fact, the word Satan actually means accuser, uh, someone who who comes to deceive and and to accuse us and kind of draw us away from the Lord and draw us into to sin. So maybe this is some kind of uh, instance of him sort of possessing the body of this serpent in its pre-fallen form or however this worked. Um, this is Satan. Like I said, Paul and John both identified this particular story in Revelation 12 and 2 Corinthians 11 as this being the devil. This is Satan. So he comes to Eve and he begins to get her to question some things. And let's think about what he's really doing here. Like, what does he ask her? He says, does God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve responds, well, No, he said we could eat from the trees in the garden. We just can't eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So as as Satan is beginning to ask her questions, what's he doing? Well, I think he's doing what he does to us every single day as he tempts us and tries to deceive us. He's, He's trying to get Eve to question God's goodness towards her. That's really what he wants to happen here, right? He wants Eve to begin to think, is God really good? Is God really for me? Does God really have my best interest at heart? Isn't this often the way that sin begins in our hearts and our minds, right? We begin to question the things that God has said to us, or we begin to question maybe even his nature and his character itself, his his very goodness. You see, Satan loves uh, to tempt us to question the goodness of God. He loves to do that. That's what he's been doing from the very beginning. He's always wanted to tempt us to question his goodness, to question who he is, to question what he's like, and to question whether or not his word is actually good for us, whether or not God is actually for our best interest and for our good. And this is exactly what he does to Eve from the very beginning, the very first temptation. And he says this to Eve. He says, you will not surely die, verse 4. He, sa- uh, he says, for God knows that when you eat of it, when you eat of this tree, that your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So right there, again, Satan kind of impugns the righteousness of God by saying, God, God's just trying to keep something from you, right? You're, you're not going to die, Eve. Now that's a lie. Here's, here's what Satan's doing. He's lying to her, but he also mixes in a little truth with the lie. This is what makes the lie so compelling. This is what makes all lies really, really good when they are really good lies because Satan mixes in some truth with the lie. He says, you're not surely going to die. Now that's a lie. But then he says this, he says, God knows that if you eat of this, you will be like him knowing good and evil. Now there's some truth there because we're going to see when they eat the fruit, what happens? Their eyes are open and they understand now good and evil in a way that they didn't before. So Satan mixes in a little truth, but here's what Eve forgot. And here's what I think we often forget in the same thing that Eve was doing. Eve had forgotten that she was already like God. We learn this from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that man and woman, they were made in the image of God. Right, Genesis 1, 27, that we are created in his likeness, created in his image. And so Satan is coming and he's going, no, God just doesn't want you to be like him. But the reality is she's already like him. But that wasn't enough for her in this moment, right? Satan's playing into that. He's playing into, and here's a word that I think we can kind of grab hold of here about like what the nature of sin is. He's playing into her pride. This is the nature of our sin. It's, it's pridefulness. It's, it's this mindset that uh, I, I, I just haven't gotten enough from God. I deserve more from God. Yeah, he made me to be like him. He made me to be in his image. But pride is essentially this idea and this belief that we deserve something more. We deserve something better. And we deserve to, to know more, to have more, to earn more, to gain more than what God has actually given us. You see, Eve wanted to be God more than she wanted to know God. That's essentially 
What is happening here? And Satan is just holding that out to her on a silver platter. Oh, I know that you want to be God. I know that you want to know everything God knows. You want to be just like him. In fact, you want to be him. So here's the way that that can happen, Eve. If you will just take this fruit and eat what God has told you not to eat, that you'll become more like him than you already are. Now, here's the reality, though. Satan doesn't really do anything to make Eve eat this fruit, does he? He didn't drag her to the tree. Think about this. Why was Eve even close enough to the tree that she could see the serpent in the tree? Why was she there in the first place? You have to imagine Adam and Eve have an entire paradise, an entire garden to eat whatever fruits they want to eat from whatever trees they want to eat them from. And yet, they are in the one place that God has told them not to be. Even before they take the fruit and they eat, there is something going on inside of their hearts and minds, this curiosity about the thing that God has forbidden that has drawn them near to this tree. And so Satan is there and he's waiting for them. Man, how relevant is this to our lives? How many times do we get ourselves in trouble and do we kind of step into sinful things simply because we are where we are not supposed to be? I mean, we can blame other people we can blame other circumstances. We can blame Satan if we want to. And Adam and Eve certainly could have blamed Satan, and they did. We'll, we'll see that in a second. But the reality is, man, they were, they were there. They were by the tree that God had already forbidden them to be by. They stepped into a place where they weren't even supposed to be. And so Satan just simply is there. He's waiting to hold out to them this, this fruit. Really what he's doing is he's holding out to them this promise that they will now be God if they will simply take and eat the fruit. Because sin always makes promises that it cannot keep. And in this instance, we see that happen. So Genesis 3, 6, basically it says that she saw that it was good for food and it was pleasing to the eyes and it was also desirable for gaining wisdom. So this temptation just keeps getting deeper and deeper. It's pleasing to my my eyes. It's pleasing to my heart. It's what I want. It's what I desire. Not only is it going to taste good, but it's going to get me where I want to be. And she takes and she eats and then she gives it to Adam and Adam takes it and he eats. And then instantly something changes. Verse seven and eight. Let's read this again. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. Now, how did chapter two end? It said that they were naked and they felt no shame. So instantly, Satan had made them this promise that when you take and eat of this, you're going you're gonna to be God now. You're going to know everything that God knows. You're going to be just like him. He's been trying to hold you guys down. And when you eat this fruit, all of that's going to change. And when they eat the fruit, something does change, but it's not what they thought was going to change. They didn't become God all of a sudden. All that changed was that now they felt shame. Now they knew that something was wrong because something was wrong. Now sin had entered in and they felt this immediate sense of their own nakedness and their own shame and they realized that they had done something drastically, drastically tragic. They had dishonored the one who created them. They had dishonored the one whom they knew and had perfect relationship with, God himself, their creator. And they felt shame. You see, sin always leads to shame. And what does shame leads lead to? Shame leads to separation. So here's what they do. Verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? So let's pause again. What does the shame lead to? The shame leads to separation. They were ashamed because the perfect God-given identity that they had been created with had now been tainted by sin. And they were guilty and they were broken and they were ashamed. And as a result, like we we talked about at the beginning, they did what has been the most human nature thing to do in our shame since the very beginning. They ran and they hid somewhere when they heard God coming through the garden in the cool of the day. Now, 
this was something that God always did. It's clear to us from the first couple of chapters of Genesis that God and Adam and Eve, they had this perfect relationship. They knew one another intimately. And this would have been not an uncommon thing for God to come walking through the garden towards them, to come and converse with them, to come and speak with them and spend time with them. But for the first time, no longer is this a, a joyful thing for Adam and Eve to hear the Lord as he's walking toward them in the garden. This is not a joyful thing. Now it is a dreadful thing thing and now they run and they hide. This is one of the most sad moments in all of human history. Maybe the saddest moment that from the very beginning this perfect relationship is now broken and instead of feeling joy when they hear God coming, they feel fear when they hear God coming. Why? Why are they afraid? Why do they not uh, believe that this is going to be a good thing as God is now drawing near to them again? Why did they hide? There's this thing called object permanence. Object permanence is our ability as human beings to know that when we can't see something, that it hasn't disappeared. Uh, this is why, as like when you play peekaboo with a little child, when I, when I used to play peekaboo with my daughter, and you hide their face or you hide your face, and then you pull the thing down, like they are so amazed every time you do it, right? You you hide yourself and where where are you? Where's daddy or whatever? And then they're, they're freaking out. They don't know where you went. They're giggling, they're wondering, they're looking around. You pull it down and they get so excited because now you're there again because tiny children before about the age of one year old, they don't understand, they don't have object permanence. They believe that you truly disappeared when you're hidden or when they're hidden. But as we get older and, you know, once you're two years older or kind of beyond that, you, you begin to understand, even though I can't see something, that doesn't mean it's not there. Now, all of us learn object permanence at a very young age, but here's the thing that we still struggle to learn. I think we still struggle to learn God permanence. We still struggle to believe that even when we hide ourselves or we even, even when God is not near to us or God, we can't see God or he can't see us, so to speak, that he's not there and that he doesn't know. And that if I can hide myself from him, that he won't find out who I am or what I've done, or I can kind of cover up my own shame. And we saw that as soon as Adam and Eve sinned in this way, not only did they uh, hide, but before they did that, they covered themselves in fig leaves, right? So they feel this shame, they cover themselves, and then they run and they hide, hoping maybe that God just won't know what happened or maybe that God can't find them this time. So God comes walking to them in the cool of the day, just like he always did. And here's the thing that I think we need to remember about this. In this moment, it's not God who has changed. It's them. It's Adam and Eve. God is still the same. God is still walking through the garden to come and to see them and to speak with them. It's they now who feel shame and have hidden themselves. Guys, sin changes us. It doesn't change God. And we believe sometimes in our sin, especially when we're really struggling with some particular sinful thing in our lives, we sometimes get this feeling or this belief that maybe our sin has changed God, maybe the way that he sees us or maybe the way that he feels about us or maybe the, the fatherly love that he has towards us as believers in Jesus. But the reality is God doesn't change, we change. We are the ones who hide, we are the ones who feel shame, we are the ones who cover up. And we kind of put that on to God sometimes and believe that it's like it's his problem or that if we can just hide ourselves that he won't understand or he won't figure it out but God doesn't change even when we do so why are they hiding well if you go back to Genesis 2 17 God promised them this he promised them that if they ate of the of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil like Eve told the serpent that they would surely die so what do they believe is about to happen as God comes walking to them in the cool of day, what do they think is he, he is going to do to them? Kill them. I think they thought as God is walking towards them, he's coming to kill us. He told us we were going to die. And now we did the thing he told us not to do. And so surely God is going to make right on that promise. He's going to come and end our lives. We must hide from him. But not only did God not come to scold them, he sought them out. Not only did God not condemn them, he called them. Not only did God not kill them, but he clothed them. Now let's read what happens. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, 
I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. This is Adam talking. I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. And he said, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, of course, God knows the answers to these questions. God doesn't ask questions because he doesn't know things, okay? God asks questions because he does know things, and he wants us to know what he already knows. He wants Adam and Eve to come out, right? Maybe God is just asking them these questions. Where are you? What have you done? Why have you done this? Maybe God's just asking them those questions because he wants them to come out of hiding. He wants them to confess, and he wants them to be healed. God does this for us, right? He gives us the gift of repentance and confession so that we can come out of our hiding and be healed in this moment. So that's what he's doing with Adam and Eve. And he says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And then Adam blames Eve and then Eve blames the serpent uh, and so forth and so on. We kind of see this, this blame game. And then here's what happens just to quickly kind of kind of recap this. Uh, God does dish out some punishments, but he doesn't kill them. He doesn't condemn them. He doesn't even scold them. He, he, he gives them some, some consequences of their actions, and he does end up kind of expelling them from the garden and from the tree of life. And the beautiful thing is we, we see this tree of life reappear in Revelation, that we now all eat from the tree of life in Jesus Christ, that we will live eternally. But between then and, 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 and in the end, um, God kind of expels humanity from this perfect paradise, and he dishes out some consequences. But the, the most beautiful Thing happens in between that, that God doesn't kill them. In fact, he does something really kind of unexpected. He doesn't even let them stay in their shame. Here's what he does. It says in verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That's Genesis 3, 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. Here's a little Bible trivia question for you. What is the first death in all the history of the world? It's Genesis 3.21. Some animal that God killed, that he sacrificed, and gave the skin to Adam and Eve to clothe their nakedness and their shame. So what's, what's going on here? That God comes walking to them in the cool of the day. He speaks with them. He asks them questions just like he always did. He calls them out of their hiding. Yes, he gives them some consequences for their actions, but also he clothes their shame. How? With the covering of an innocent sacrifice. And so even from the beginning, we are seeing that this story this story that God is writing is going to entail the sacrificing of the innocent to cover the shame of the guilty. We read uh, in Romans chapter 5 that God talks about through Adam, through his sin, all of us were made guilty of sin. And yet through Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, through him, we are made righteous. We are clothed with his righteousness. Our shame is covered by his blood and our unrighteousness and our sin is covered by the righteousness of Christ. Even from the beginning in the garden, God was painting this picture for us that this story, this story would not just be about our failures. It would be about his sovereign victory over sin and over shame, that he would come in, that he would step in. And even when we sin and even when we hide in our shame, he would still come and he would not forsake his people. And he would do this over and over and over again through the Old Testament and then in the New Testament, Again, we would see this ultimately in the person of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the ultimate seek of God in this game of hide and seek, that we hide and God sought us out. He seeks us through Jesus ultimately, and he came and he laid his life down to now clothe us with his righteousness and to cover our nakedness and our shame. And so what do we do 
as we see this story that just so epitomizes our our human nature, our sinfulness, that man, we we sometimes we we just go where we're not supposed to go, and we see the things that we're not supposed to see, and we take the things that we're not supposed to take, and we do the things that we're not supposed to do, just because our hearts love those things maybe more than we love God. And like Eve, sometimes we want to be God of our own lives more than we want to know God in our lives. What what do we do? Well, I would just say this this morning. I, I would just say, first of all, we confess like Adam and Eve did when God called them out. Where are you? What have you done? Confess. God knows the answer to all the questions. He knows where you're at. He knows what you've done. And if you're hiding, he knows exactly where you're hiding. You haven't hidden so far as that God can't see you where you're at. He sees you and he knows you. But he's calling you out right now. He's calling you to himself to come and confess and repent and turn to Jesus in faith. The one who sacrificed himself, laid down his life to cover your sin and your shame. The perfect, innocent sacrifice. So confess and repent and turn to Jesus. And then the other thing I would just say is this. Stop hiding. Stop hiding. Listen, Christian, if you mess up, and you're gonna mess up, okay? We all mess up, we all make mistakes. You have two options every time. You can run and you can hide away from God or you can run to God. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And I think the truth of that is as we draw near to God, we find that he was already near to us. He's already walking through the garden in the cool of the day. He's already coming to to heal us, to speak with us, to redeem us. And that's our word for today. The word is redeem. That even from the very beginning, God made this clear that this story is not going to be about our rebellion. It's going to be about his redemption of humanity. And ultimately, that redemption came through the person of Jesus Christ. So confess your sins and, and listen, just come out of hiding. Come out of hiding. God knows you and he wants you to know him and draw near to him. Let's pray. Lord, Father, thank you. Thank you that you are writing this story of redemption, that you've been writing this story from the very beginning. And I pray today that if any of us are hiding in our sin, if any of us feel unworthy, that we would remember that, yeah, we we are unworthy. And that's the whole point of the gospel, that even though we are unworthy of you, you still have come to us. You still have sent your son Jesus to us to die for us and cover our nakedness and our shame. So let us just put on the righteousness of Christ and come out of hiding, confess and repent and turn to Jesus today in faith. And God, I just, I just praise you that even from the beginning, we see this story being written, this beautiful and glorious story of redemption, the sacrifice of an innocent to cover the shame of the guilty. God, thank you. Thank you for the blood, the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, for our sins. Let us come out of hiding. And let us know you as you know us. In Jesus' name, amen.